uh, in general, people have this perception that Tamil schools uh, are in bad shape. Uh, that probably is uh, true to some extent. There are gaps in the implementation, but the fact remains the government spends uh, close to 600 million a year on Tamil schools system. So, for the promotion of a minority language, Tamil uh, school system, the government spends 600 million to educate roughly 100,000 children. So, so there is a, a positive aspect to that, but nonetheless, that, that's a good part, that the you know, government is actually spending so much money, uh, mainly for salaries of teachers, uh, you know, uh, so that they are, they are close to 10,000, 9,500 teachers in the system, so, so for, to support them as well as those who have retired, so a large amount of money is actually being spent. Nonetheless, we face issues on the ground uh, from the school perspective, which is, for example, the school, the Glanberry Tamil School, where we, I, I became the chairman in, 19, in 2007, after two years of struggle, because the Act, Malaysian Education Act, actually provides for uh, the setup of school boards in every school. Article 53 is very clear. It says every school, every Tamil school shall have a school board, but for some reason, the the, the state level authorities don't encourage this or don't want this, so they give all kind of excuses on why it should not be, uh, there shouldn't be a school board. But nonetheless, somehow we pushed and, you know, we just fought and, you know, after some time someone, you know, they, they regularly change, the officers change, so some guy, you know, who, is, who doesn't know, or at least he was friendly, so we, we got, got through and then we established the school board. The reason, one of the main problems when, when after going into the school was the school was allocated three acres, which itself is below the regulation. The regulation stipulates the school, a school should have five acres. So I do not know why, for some reason, when it comes to Tamil schools, the authorities think three acres is fine or even less is okay. Uh, but actually, if you follow the, you know, uh, KPKT, the, the Perumahan requirement, for schools, a primary school must have between 5 to 8 acres, especially when it goes for development. And Glen Mary went for development, the, the, the Ladang Glen Mary went for development. So they should have allocated at least 5 acres, but they only allocated 3. Not only that, they thought that land also is considered Kawasan Lapang. So that's a field for the, the, you know, the folks around who are living there. Okay, they were built houses, I think Charles, you were involved in that area. So they, 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 they built these houses and then they were supposed to give a proper field. So instead they said, well, you know, the school field is also their field. So you kind of have uh, three acres of land allocated for school instead of five and that also serves as a field for the local community who was living there before. Fine. But because this land was not explicitly allocated, the way things work here is that this is allocated for Tamil school, no one really looks after Tamil school because it's like, okay, Tamil school, right? So, no one took charge of that school. The government thinks Tamil school is not, the Ministry of Education doesn't quite, I'll come to that later, Ministry of Education doesn't quite see Tamil schools as their work. It's like sometimes MIC or it's between MIC and the Ministry of Education, it falls in the crack. That's where Tamil schools continue to remain to this day. There are some measures, but anyway, it's still there until now. So. One guy, he thought, okay, this land is empty, so I will put a, like a Basi Buro shop there. So in, in the school field, we had Basi Buro guy, right? So the first thing that we did as a school board was to actually get him out of that place, right? So he was like, you know, some gangster, so the local community was afraid to locate him. We, and then finally, we, thankfully, by then the election came and you know, changed and so immediately put a PKR flag there. <laughs> so, okay, then this guy came, the, the enforcer, uh, MBSA guys came and, you know, and then they put a notice. But finally, after one year, we did evict this guy. And then finally, we put a, uh, like a, a, a fence around the school. And we did get back our field. But even then, there's some, 
you know, because uh, this is also the public field, the field has other developments from, uh, you know, like as any other, you know, like any field today is open for anything. You can build anything in our fields. So similarly, we have others, our other things in our field, but, but still okay. We managed to salvage that three acres of land. We managed to have set up a, a school field now with the help of Sarjana Golf Club, so they are maintaining the school field now. Uh, we kind of uh, did a quid pro quo, so they can play football in our field and they will maintain it uh, in return. So that's the school field story. The other one is the building. So the government apparently allocated, uh, actually the, the, the thing is, they, we recently got a building uh, worth 2.5 million, which is good, it's a good story. I mean, this is what the Prime Minister is going around telling that, you know, we built so much. We will say that 400 million was spent for Tamil school, which is true to a large extent. But the story of how this was implemented is very, very strange. For example, like the, the 2.5 million out of that, actually the Tamil school was, the Glenmary Tamil school was allocated 1.8 million ringgit. The allocation was done by uh, Datu Sri S. Sami Velu without any consultation with the school itself. So he just designed something by himself without really knowing where the school is or visiting or, you know, they, they just designed something and then finally the JKR came and said, okay, we are going to build a school. Oh, really? Where are we going to build a school? On the field, directly in the, in, in, in exactly in the middle of the field. So we had to struggle, say, well, you know, we just saved this field. Can you like, you know, put it by the side somewhere so that, you know, we can have a field. So it took us one year to relocate and that cost us 180,000. And then that again, you know, we went to Dato Sri Dato Deomani to, you know, lobby and change and, you know, that happened. But it's just that the question like, why is it always like this? Why should it be uh, that we have to struggle for something? The government is willing to spend all this, there's some allocation or something or there is there. But for some reason, this is such a low priority item or whatever that there's hardly any consultation the local community with the the headmasters, who are after all government employees, you know, there are 12 of them there, so they are government employees, they should have been consulted, there is a school board, they could have been consulted, and uh, hardly any consultation takes place, it's after the fact, something happens and then they come and they talk about it. Uh, finally, the school was built. So in that sense, I am happy that a lot of things are happening, uh, but I am still sad or confused that uh, certain things are always done wrongly. Uh, and finally, one more point about my school. The, the, we have 12 teachers, I said. Out of the 12 teachers, until recently, three of them were untrained. So that again raises the question, like how can you have 25% of your, you know, your, your labor force are actually untrained, when the national average for untrained teachers is only 3%. So there's something really wrong here. So it just, which is one of the big point, point about Tamil schools that large number percentage of Tamil school teachers were untrained. This was highlighted over the last, I don't know, 40 years. Finally this year or last year they did address this. So now they have brought that from 25% or 20%, they have brought it down to something like I think 7-8%, which is good. But I am doubtful about all the people who have been included in the system in a rush. But anyway, they have done it. The, nonetheless, we have still faced this problem of Tamil school curriculum is a Tamil curriculum. Similarly, Chinese school curriculum is a Chinese curriculum. The medium of instruction is Chinese, Mandarin or Tamil. So you can't have someone who doesn't speak the language implement the curriculum. You can't have you know, someone who is uh, primarily, whose medium of, uh, who is conf uh, who, whose first language is Malay to come and speak uh, implement a curriculum in Tamil. It won't happen. So there is a system, it is not being adhered to. So the question is why? And I have a theory for that. Maybe I'll end with that. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to talk about it because it's supposed to be from the field. So anyway, I'll, I, the reason we have these issues is because the government doesn't quite recognize, or it doesn't, it doesn't recognize Tamil and Chinese Mandarin as promoted languages in Malaysia. They always think these schools are provisional. They are there for a while. We will eventually close them down or we will convert them to become national schools or we will somehow eradicate these languages out of this, this country or something other. Otherwise, 
I don't understand why the government that spends little over close to 2 billion ringgit a year for the promotion of a school system, a language school system, always doesn't have an officer. The main guy who is coordinating Tamil and Chinese schools is a 34 level officer. In Tamil school there's a 34 level officer, in Chinese school there's a 34 level officer. That means he's actually a, a clerk, right? A senior clerk maybe. So you are having a system that is spending so much money, but there is no coordination. Why is that? That's the question. Whether it's textbooks, Tamil school textbook, Chinese school textbooks, whether it's curriculum, whether it's a teacher training, at every level we find gaps that it is not always like they develop a policy for, they develop a plan for the national schools and you can translate. Someone, you know, out of the, you know, some 34 level officer, they can translate it to a uh, Tamil system. So there are huge gaps in implementation. So the reason when we confront this, like why is there a gap? Why aren't you addressing this? Why aren't you putting a, say, a 52, a deputy director post for Tamil school, deputy director post for uh, Chinese, uh, ta Chinese school and Tamil school? Who will coordinate the respective schools with various agencies, various divisions within the ministry, various divisions? They all do different, different things. They must be coordinated. Like one of the main things in Malaysia is everyone do work in silos, right? This happens in bureaucracies. People work in silos. It must be coordinated if we are to achieve the national objective, whatever the objective is. And it's not, hap not happening. And when we confront this, they say, this is our dasa, our, our policy is not to promote these schools. Why? Because the language is not promoted. So unless and until the language is recognized as, okay, this is also the language of the people of Malaysia, they will always, we will always face, face this discrimination or this uh, so-called tidaf attitude about these schools, even though they spend the money, because they are willing to spend the money, but they are not willing to give the recognition, because it is always provisional. And uh, as long as we remain like that, we will always face this discrimination, I believe. And, and one of the things that I hope that can happen at some point may, you know, is the recognition. And from there, the implementation can come uh, you know, as a result.